All right, aloha. Welcome to the second part of lecture 12. In part one, we learned about endochondral and intramembranous bone formation. We learned about how cartilage forms. We learned about the formation of the long bones of the appendicular skeleton. And we talked a little bit about joint formation. Today, we are going to talk about the formation of the axial skeleton, which for purposes of this class consists of the head, spine, ribs, and sternum. We're gonna start with the spine. Now, this is a cross-section of a four-week-old embryo. It's a diagram of a cross-section of a four-week-old embryo. Uh, for purposes of orientation, we'll just say that it's in the thoracic region, so somewhere in the rib cage. So I want you to notice the, the square. So we have the, the somites here, right? The, the different layers of the somites. Uh, we have the sclerotome here, you know, in this green triangle is the uh, sclerotome of the somite. And then we have the myotome and the dermatome of the somites. Uh, so what's going to happen is immediately around the notochord here, you're going to have uh, this sclerotome tissue from the somite is going to start condensing and proliferating. And as it condenses and proliferates, it's going to grow up and around the neural tube until finally it meets in the middle up here. Um, interestingly enough, this whole process happens through differential tissue growth. Uh, eventually we're going to end up with something like this by about week five. Now I want you to notice that this nerve has already gone out. It already went out like in week four, like the beginning of week four to whatever tissue it's going to affect. And it is going to follow that tissue wherever in the body that it goes. I really think that's cool. Um, but yeah, so as this vertebral, as this vertebra grows around the neural tube, uh, all that happens is it just adds cells like building blocks, stacks a few more here and a few more here and a few more here until it finally meets in the middle. There's no migration of cells at all. It's just differential tissue growth. Uh, so let's take a look at, um, make sure I didn't miss anything real quick here. Okay, very good. Let's take a look at a coronal section. So this would be looking uh, at the spine from the front and the spine's cut in half. Okay, so we're looking uh, at the four week embryo, you'll notice that the notochord is still pretty much intact, it's still pretty much all there. But by five weeks, most of that notochord is gone, right? Except for this little nubbin that gets encased by the discs, right? <clears throat> now the discs form exactly the way we talked about. Um, you start with uh, dense interzonal connective tissue, dense mesenchyme tissue, and then it differentiates into fiber cartilage. And in this case, it, um, as the mesenchyme condenses into its dense form, it encapsulates a little section of the notochord. Now this little nubbin of notochord is eventually going to expand and proliferate, and it's gonna form the entire gelatinous center of this disc known as the nucleus pulposa. You're gonna to wanna to remember that because it's gonna be on a quiz. So let me repeat it. This little nubbin of notochord that's left over is going to expand and fill up the whole inside of this disc with a gelatinous substance called the nucleus pulposus. Now, as an interesting side note, in adults, when this disc tears and this nucleus pulposus escapes into the surrounding tissues, it is extremely, extremely caustic and inflammatory. It causes just an intense, immense inflammatory response. Now, uh, one possibility for why that is, is because, well, what does the notochord do? What's its primary purpose? It induces neurulation, right? So it's a primary tissue inducer. Its purpose is to induce undifferentiated tissue to differentiate. Now, if you take some of that and stick it right next to some tissue that's already fully differentiated, so it cannot differentiate any further, it's probably going to be interpreted as an inflammatory stimulus. That's one theory. A more plausible theory is this stuff gets encapsulated inside the disc already by week five. And this is well before the immune system has begun to develop, right? Right. 
and no blood flow really goes inside the disc. The disc is um, nourished by a process called imbibation, um, which basically is kind of like squeezing and releasing a sponge. That's how the waste gets out and the clean nutrients get in. Really no blood flows into the disc. So this is completely novel to your immune system. It has never seen it before and it doesn't interpret it as you. So you take this stuff and rip that disc and it spills out into the surrounding tissue and all of a sudden there's this novel substance that your immune system has never seen before. And so it mounts an enormous offensive. It just is like, we have to get this stuff out of here. It's a foreign substance. It isn't us, it has to be dealt with. And so you launch a massive inflammatory response. Now um, that's the way that most of the research and literature um, talks about or the cause that most of the research and literal literature talks about nowadays, but both are plausible theories. Um, I lean a little more towards that second one. Anyway, that's just a side note. None of that will be on the quiz. Don't worry about it. That was just for your interesting information because I'm a chiropractor and I like sharing stuff like that. Something else though that you do want to note, if you look at the vertebral bodies relative to the intersegmental arteries, right? Look at the position of the vertebral bodies relative to the intersegmental arteries. And you can see that the vertebral body is going to be formed by the mesenchyme or the, scler the sclerotome of the somite above and the, sclerot uh, the sclerotome of the somite below. So the sclerotome from two separate somites are going to join together to form each intervert or yeah, each vertebral body. I think that's fascinating. Um, it's not too weird though, when you think about it, if you know the anatomy uh, and you look at the facet joints or the zygapophyseal joints that people who want to sound fancy call it, uh, but the joints at the back of the spine, those joints are made up of, <clears throat> you know, here, let me, um, unscreen share for a second so you can see my hands. You, you've got half of the joint that's attached to one vertebrae and half of the joint that's attached to the other vertebrae and that they form a synovial joint so that, you know, and they kind of move against each other like this. Now, interestingly enough, that facet joint would then both halves, the lower half and the upper half would then be from the same somite, but the vertebral bodies that they're attached to well, I guess the lower half of this vertebral body and the lower and the upper half of this vertebral body would all be from the same somite. So I think that's interesting, but then the body itself, let me go ahead and turn the screen share back on. Um, the body itself then is made of the sclerotome from two adjacent somites combining together. One forms the bottom and one forms the top. That's just an interesting little factoid. It might turn up on a quiz. It probably will turn up on a quiz and maybe even a final. Um, so you'll want to remember and write it down that each vertebral body is made of cells from two different sclerotomes. Now, as the disc forms, the remaining densely packed mesenchyme combines with the loosely arranged mesenchyme from the somite directly below it. Um, and the two combine to form the upper and lower halves of the vertebral, bo vertebral body. Uh, at any rate, so I usually draw a picture of this on the board and it makes a lot more sense when I draw the diagram on the board, but you know, I do the best I can with what I've got because I don't have a blackboard here or a class to draw it for. At any rate, so once we've got this mesenchymal model pretty well formed, now we start the process of chondrification. We have to turn this mesenchyme into cartilage. Uh, because yes, the spine does entirely all of the spine forms through endochondral bone formation. So you start with um, these primary chondrification centers. These are the guys that are here in blue. Um, and this basically starts happening during the sixth week. You see the chondrocytes appear at the chondrification centers. And from there they spread far and, far and wide and they replace all the mesenchyme tissue with cartilage. Toward the end of the embryonic period, which is the first eight weeks, um, all the different centers are gonna be fused together. So these guys are gonna spread out and, and anyway, they're gonna all zip together into one big massive uh, cartilaginous model of the bone. Um, 
Interestingly enough, there is not a well-defined spinous process or a well-defined transverse process at this point in time. Um, these guys are formed by, ex or uh, let me rephrase that. <laughs> the mesenchyme model does not have a well-defined spinous process or a well-defined transverse processes. The spinous process and transverse processes are formed during this process of chondrification. These will actually extend out as the cartilage proliferates and the spinous process will extend out as the cartilage proliferates. So it's pretty cool. Uh, now, after the entire cart cartilaginous model is formed, now we can start ossification. So ossification begins in the spine uh, towards the end of the eighth week. It starts, you know, not long after the femur starts to ossify. Uh, it starts with the ventral and dorsal ossification centers. And so that's these two guys right here. And it doesn't take very long before these guys come together and, and end up joining together. So now we have just a central ossification center. Uh, and then we have uh, the two ossification centers in the neural arch. Uh, let me see. So as the as ossification spreads, right? Because this is going to get bigger, right? Ossification is going to start here and it's going to spread out from there. As it spreads, you're going to have these areas right here, right here, and right here that are going to remain cartilage. And the reason that these are going to remain cartilage is because this neural arch right here has to get bigger as the spinal cord grows. This space has to be able to grow. So we leave a little band of cartilage here and here and here to accommodate the spinal cord as it gets bigger, right? Um, you'll see a similar thing in the cervical spine where there's these little holes for the cervical artery that go right through that band of cartilage. Similar purpose. We need to be uh, we need to be able to allow for this hole to get bigger as the as the kid grows. Uh, so the two halves of the posterior arch fuse during the first three to six years after birth, um, and the neurocentral joint usually fuses around age six. Okay, so these these are gonna. <clears throat> Uh, these two are going to fuse together between the ages of uh, three to six years old. And then sometime after age six, these guys are going to fuse. Now, the reason that that happens so early in life is because after that, the spinal cord doesn't really get any bigger. Um, and it doesn't really even get any longer. The bones will get longer. The spinal column will get a, a lot longer. You remember we talked about that when we did the nervous system, how uh, by the time you're an adult, your spinal cord only goes down to like L1, right? So the spinal cord doesn't grow much after you're six years old, you just that the bones get a lot longer. And uh, so these guys pretty much fuse by the time you're age six. Which brings us to the next slide. So these are the secondary ossification centers. Uh, these secondary ossification centers do not show up until around puberty, okay? Um, that might end up being on a quiz too. So let's repeat that so you can write it down. The secondary ossification centers of the spinal column do not show up until puberty. They do not form until around puberty. Now the parts that are pink are gonna remain cartilage to allow for further growth right? Because these vertebral bodies are going to have to get taller and these spinous processes and uh, transverse processes are going to need to get longer as this kid grows all throughout his life until you're an adult. And then they fully fuse, uh, you know, in the early 20s if you're a guy, earlier than that if you're a girl. So <clears throat> the book says that it happens at 25, but the book is wrong and I'm right, okay? So the bones are going to be fully fused by the early 20s for guys and a little bit sooner than that for girls. You're going to want to remember that because it will be on the quiz. My answer, not the book's answer. <laughs> early 20s, all the bones in the spine will be fully fused. Take it from a chiropractor. I know the spine better than any PhD. Uh, let's see. 
ribs. Ribs is next. Let's talk about ribs. So basically what's going to happen with the ribs is you have this thing called the costal process. And that guy is basically going to grow out and expand and grow around the front of the body. And of course, as it does so, it's eventually going to chondrify. And then it's eventually going to ossify. Um, during the embryonic period is when this happens and synovial joints are going to form between the rib. So the rib will be growing out this way and there will be a synovial joint that will form between the rib and the vertebral body. So there's actually going to be a synovial joint here and incidentally another one here where the transverse process is eventually going to be. Um, but just to help you remember, just for a quick review, the synovial joints form by first forming densely packed mesenchyme tissue, uh, then the outer edges um, differentiate into the capsule, fibrous tissue to form the capsule, then the inside, the center, um, hollows out via apoptosis, and the remaining dense mesenchyme tissue is going to differentiate into synovial membrane tissue, which is going to produce synovial fluid for the joint, right? So all that's going to happen as these ribs are forming, as they're growing around the body. Um, they don't start to off. Uh, they don't start to ossify until into the uh, fetal period, in conjunction with all of the other bones. So along with the ribs, we also have to develop a sternum. We have to have something in the front for those ribs to attach to. So what happens is as these ribs are growing around the body towards the front, you see these bands of mesenchymal tissue that begin to condense. That's a common theme, huh? And these are called sternal bars. So as these sternal bars form, starting at the top, they come together and they fuse and they zip together while they're still mesenchyme then they chondrify, then they ossify. Uh, they, and this happens in conjunction with all the other bones during the early part of the fetal period. Uh, and you end up with, <clears throat> at first, several sections that all fuse together. And uh, by adulthood, you end up with something like this, right? You have this manubrium up here, the sternal body down here, and the xiphoid process down here. Now, the xiphoid process doesn't always ossify. Sometimes this guy stays cartilage through your whole life and never turns into bone. That's okay. That's common and it's normal and it's not a big deal. Uh, let's see. So next up is the skull. So the skull can be divided into two basic parts, the neurocranium, which encases the brain, and the visceral cranium, which makes up the rest of the face, right? So up here is the neurocranium, the brain is inside there, and then the visceral cranium down here is the rest of your face. Um, <clears throat> both the neurocranium and the visceral cranium have components that form via endochondral bone formation and intramembranous bone formation. You see both types of bone formation on both halves. So the book gives a lot more detail on this than all of the other parts of the skeleton, but that's kind of okay because it's actually kind of cool, right? So the part of the neurocranium that encases the brain that forms through endochondral ossification is the floor, right? So this would be us looking down into the uh, skull from the top. And, you know, if we cut the top off and took out the brain, we're looking down at the floor of the skull, right? So what happens is you have these guys named the trabeculae, I don't even know how you say it anymore. <laughs> the trabeculae cranii, that's how it is, the, the trabecula cranii. And these guys are gonna eventually fuse together as you can see down here, and they're gonna you know, fuse trabeculae. And then you have these uh, nasal, what are they called? Uh, nasal capsules, yeah, there we go. Uh, these nasal capsules are gonna, or no, this is the nasal capsule down here. These are the nasal, hold on, it'll come to me. It will, I promise. Um, sacs, there we go, nasal sacs. So these are the nasal sacs and they are gonna be surrounded by the nasal capsule. Anyway, um, oh, by the way, it is worth mentioning 
that for purposes of the quiz, so I know all of this is really complicated, okay? I'm gonna go through it. I'm gonna try to explain it the best I can, but what you need to know for the quiz, so write this down, what you need to know for the quiz is that the floor of the neurocranium forms endochondrally and that the rest of the neurocranium forms intramembranously. The floor of the neurocranium is formed by endochondral bone formation, a cartilaginous model that then ossifies, whereas the rest of the cranium, the rest of the neurocranium is formed by intramembranous bone formation where there is no cartilage. Okay, so yeah, these two trabeculae cranii fused together, these um, cranial or uh, nasal sacs are surrounded by the nasal capsule. Um, these hypotheseal cartilages are going to join together, they're going to all fuse. There's going to be a little space that hollows out in the middle to house the, um... boy, I'm on a roll tonight. My mammillary bodies are failing me today. The pituitary gland, thank you. <laughs> so they're going to form a little hollow spot that's going to house the pituitary gland. And then this is going to become eventually the ethmoid, the sphenoid bone, <laughs> the sphenoid bone. You also have these ala orbitalis and ala temporalis. And these are gonna become the greater and lesser wings of the sphenoid bone. Excuse me. Uh, Allah is gonna become the lesser wing and temporalis is gonna become the uh, greater, ring, greater wing of the sphenoid bone. Uh, make sure I got all of that right. Let me look back at my notes here. Yes, correct. So the ala orbitalis and temporalis become the lesser and greater wings of the sphenoid, respectively. Um, <clears throat> the precordal cartilage down here, uh, or sorry, para, paracordal cartilage, right? It's because we're talking about where the, uh, where the notochord used to be. That's where the name comes from. So this paracordal cartilage is going to uh, join with the occipital somites, the, the sclerotomes of the occipital somites, they're going to all join together and they're going to form the occipital cartilage. This occipital cartilage is going to grow down and around and it's going to surround the base of the brainstem forming the foramen magnum. Okay, um, this otic capsule over here is going to get bigger and it's going to form the petrous part of the temporal bone. Okay, hopefully I got all of that. Now, the rest of the neural cranium is called the calvaria. And the calvaria is a Latin word that means skull cap. All you need to know about the calvaria, about the top of the neural cranium, the skull cap, is that it is formed by intramembranous bone formation, okay? The top half of the neurocranium is all formed by intramembranous bone formation. The plates are joined together by dense fibrous tissue called fontanelles. And as the skull cap closes during early childhood, as the bones get larger and closer together and the skull cap closes, the fontanelles become fibrous tissue and that is what holds the suture joints of the skull plates together. They do not fuse. They are held together by this uh, fibrous joint. Okay. Now, <clears throat> the existence and the looseness of these fibrous joints and the fontanelles uh, is really, really important during childbirth. Super important during childbirth. Um, let me pull you off of screen share for a second. And I'll show you why. So what you do, boy, let me sit up a little bit here. So what happens is you have these two parts of the skull and you have this fontanelle and these loose connective joints, right? These uh, fibrous connective tissue joints that are nice and flexible and loose. And so the skull will fold in on itself like this, right? So you come from a very large skull to something that's a little more closed and torpedo shaped and that will squeeze through the birth canal and as you come out of the birth canal those guys go pop and close back together right so a lot of um, 
let me put you back on the screen share here. Uh, so <clears throat> craniosacral therapists and an awful lot of chiropractors, myself included, uh, believe that this is a really important step in the birth process because this is what begins the craniosacral rhythm. This is what starts the craniosacral um, system into motion. And it has a significant effect on cranial motion as, uh, as you grow into, you know, through childhood and, and into adulthood. Um, so this is just one other reason that vaginal birth is a lot healthier for neonates than C-sections. You don't get that with a C-section. Now that doesn't mean that if you, you know, that your brain's going to be messed up for the rest of your life or anything like that. Don't worry. Lots of people are born by C-section and they're completely fine. <laughs> um, but it is just better. There's good and there's better, you know. Um, people who are born vaginally tend to have better cranial motion than those that were born with, uh, via C-section. Um, so the second reason for the fontanelles, <clears throat> besides going through making, making them easier to fit through the birth canal, uh, they're very important because they allow for growth of the cranium, right? The brain is not done growing when you're born, not even close. It is going to get a lot bigger. And so as your brain gets bigger, your skull also has to get bigger. And so these, uh, fontanelles and, um, fibrous tissue joints allow for easy expansion of the skull as the child's brain grows. Um, more bone is added. As the kid gets bigger, you add more bone through the same process, the intramembranous bone formation. And then that bone gets remodeled over the years by the combined action of osteoblasts and osteoclasts, which we've talked about before. Okay, now <clears throat> the visceral cranium also has cartilaginous and membranous portions. Um, there are two important things to remember here because both of these are going to be on the quiz and probably on the final, right? First is that the visceral cranium is formed from the tissues of the pharyngeal arches, okay? All of the visceral cranium is formed from the tissues of the pharyngeal arches. The second thing that's really important to remember is that the membranous portions are formed from the first pharyngeal arch while the cartilaginous portions are formed from the second, or sorry, from the first and second arches, right? So the, um, the membranous portions of the visceral cranium of the face are formed only from the first pharyngeal arch. The cartilaginous portions of the face of the visceral cranium are formed by tissues from both the first and the second arches. Now, the hyoid bone is also formed partially from the third arch, but the hyoid bone is not always considered to be part of the skull. Okay, so for purposes of the quiz, the visceral cranium is formed by the tissues of the pharyngeal arches. Remember that. The membranous portion is formed from the first pharyngeal arch only. The cartilaginous portion is formed by both the first and second arches. Okay, so I hope every, everybody got that written down. Now, um, on this diagram, the membranous parts are this dark pink, okay? This dark pink. Now, this squamous portion of the temporalis, of the temporal bone, is ultimately going to become part of the neurocranium, but it forms along with the visceral cranium, so we talk about it here, okay? Um, I'm not going to make you remember specifically which bones these are, the maxilla, maxilla the mandible, part of the nasal bone. Like, I'm not going to expect you to remember which bones specifically were formed that way. Um, but just remember that um, all of these structures were formed only from tissue from the first arch, okay? Uh, let's see. Uh, the, the cartilaginous portion is, is diagrammed in blue down here, right? The cartilaginous portion. Now, these two structures down here, the uh, um, thyroid cartilage and the... Um, uh, Crickle, is it the cricoid cartilage? The, let me look at my notes. I can't remember everything either without studying. So <laughs> interestingly enough, I do take all of these quizzes uh, before I give them to you to make sure that I can get 100% on them. Cause I figure if I can't get 100% on them, I can't expect that of you. So that oftentimes leads me to throw out or change questions if I think they're too complicated for you guys. Um, <laughs> anyway. Yes, the thyroid and cricoid cartilage down here. These guys are not bones. They stay cartilage throughout your whole life. So um, 
But these guys up here, the uh, Incus, let me think. Uh, actually, I'm gonna cheat and look at my notes. Um, right here. So the first arch forms uh, the malleus of the inner ear, the Incus and the malleus of the inner ear. And then parts of the stapes and the styloid, styloid process and part of the hyoid are all formed from the second um, pharyngeal arch. You don't need to know that for the quiz. That's just uh, for your information. Anyway, that's pretty much it for the bones, okay? Except for a couple of things. <laughs> you thought we were done. <laughs> um, a lot of people want to know about the scapula because the scapula is this weird flat shaped bone, kind of looks similar to the skull plates, um, but it's not. The scapula is completely formed by endochondral bone formation, the entire thing. The clavicle though, the clavicle is unique, your collarbone. Uh, and this will probably be on a quiz because I find it fascinating. So make sure that you write this down. When the clavicle initially forms, it forms through intramembranous bone formation, right? Which means no cartilage, intramembranous bone formation. However, once it's formed, it develops then after the fact cartilaginous, cartilaginous growth plates at either end so that as it gets larger, as the child grows and the clavicle gets larger, it does that via endochondral bone formation. So it's the only bone in the body that is formed both by intramembranous and endochondral bone formation. It does both, which is really, really cool, which is why it'll be on the quiz. So make sure you remember that part, all right? Um, so that's gonna, um, that's gonna do it for part two of lecture 12. Uh, we'll see you guys on Thursday or sooner, I guess, for part three of lecture 12. Um, if you have any questions or need clarification about anything, I know this was meaty. It was a lot. It was complex, uh, which is great because then you can really see how complicated the job of a chiropractor can be. <laughs> but in any case, if you have any questions about it or if there's anything that you'd like to have me elaborate on or whatever, um, please write those questions down. I say this every lecture, write the questions down, bring them with you to the meeting on the Zoom meeting on Thursday and, and we can make sure that everything that you need gets clarified for you. So uh, we'll see you back for part three of lecture 12. Aloha.